We train them all the same. We give them all five days of training in the classroom, and three days of training out in the field. We sponsor regional meetings and annual meetings, and we do more training. John, John, five days of training and three days of training isn't training, it's guessing. Mm -hmm. You don't Let's say it's create, 15 days. Let's say it's 15 days. You don't create a great student in five days yeah. in a class. You do not. You never will. You cannot ever expect to create an absolutely viable franchise system based upon five days and three days. It's bullshit. Welcome to the Franchise Hot Seat Podcast, where we talk about all things franchising. Now, here's your host, Dr. John P. Hayes. The E-Myth, Why Most Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It. Since its publication in 1986, the author, Michael E. Gerber, needs no introduction. E-Myth is the entrepreneurial myth that businesses are started by entrepreneurs like uh, Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos. But in the reality of things, most businesses are started by technicians who one day have what Michael Gerber calls an entrepreneurial seizure. It happens all the time. The technician who's been working for the boss for several decades suddenly realizes, maybe at a low point in his career, that I can have more time, more money, more freedom than I do working for the boss if I go into business for myself. There's the seizure. And millions of people act on it thinking that because they have a certain skill set, they will become mega successful billionaires like Bezos, Branson, and so many others. And what happens? Do they get more money, more freedom, more time? No, usually they fail. And Michael Gerber told them they would fail. He's been telling us that for decades. He told us that knowing how to do a specific thing, like making the greatest pies or fixing cars or drilling teeth will not naturally lead to success in a business. He also told us the importance of building a business that is reproducible. And while he didn't write a book about franchising, he really did write a book about franchising because Everything he has to say about how to build a successful business is precisely what every great franchise company does. Everyone in business or about to get into business needs to do one thing first. Read the E-Myth series of books by Michael E. Gerber. And if you don't believe me, I think you will believe the author himself. And so it's my great pleasure to bring to this podcast, the amazing author, Michael E. Gerber. Thank you, Michael, for joining me. It's a great Hi, pleasure and you? honor. My students will love hearing from you. My uh, fans and followers will love hearing from you as well. So I'm happy that you're able to spend some time with us. So let's get right to this question. Would Michael E. Gerber buy a franchise? <laughs> No, he wouldn't. No, he wouldn't. An entrepreneur doesn't buy a franchise. Uh, a, a manager does, a technician does, uh, an individual who is determined to acquire a system that works and then dutifully utilize that system to produce the result that franchise was designed to produce. So entrepreneurs do not buy franchises. Great entrepreneurs create great franchises, but many franchises aren't produced by entrepreneurs greatly. In fact, they don't even get the point of the franchise when they start them. They just think they're going to make a lot of money. Well, that isn't, ain't it. You know and isn't that, that amazing you know that. that they, they think yeah. this? So, so the very, very clear point that you've made, John, is that business is a system. And if the business isn't a system, it's nothing but work. And if it's work, it's just work that's being done poorly, badly, uh, inconceivably, 
incorrectly, uh, inaccurately, ineffectively by everybody working in the business, doing mm -hmm. it, doing it, doing it, doing it, day after day after day after day. And it describes the vast majority of businesses on the planet. Mm -hmm. So the thing about franchising, yes, I, I agree. The great entrepreneurs, they don't buy one because they're going to create something in many cases that they can franchise, but it doesn't always happen that way. So other than what you already said is wrong with franchising, let's go back and say, you know, I understand why you wouldn't buy a franchise as an entrepreneur, uh, but technicians and managers would buy franchises. Should yes. they buy franchises? What's wrong or what's right with franchising? Start anywhere that you want with that. Well, understand what's right with franchising. I, I, I refer to the franchise or uh, of record McDonald's. Yeah. Um, McDonald's is in fact the story underlying everything that we've ever done in our business, E-Myth. Um, anything I've ever done in all of the books that I've written and created, um, McDonald's is the heart and soul of franchising. At the heart of McDonald's is the McDonald's operating system. And so understand that a, a franchise operating system has been created in order to be able to replicate that first store thousands of times, not a hundred times, not 20 times, not 67 times, but thousands of times, like McDonald's did, like McDonald's does. And effectively, all one needs to ask is that question, is the franchise I'm looking at as elementally systematic as the franchise of McDonald's? If the answer is yes, pursue it. If the answer is you're not sure, don't. Because it becomes self-evident when you're looking at a franchise operating system, whether it is or it's not. Franchisor, who is in fact a business format franchisor, essentially says, this is how we do it here. This is how every single one of our franchisees do it here. And if they don't, they're not here. Mm -hmm. Out of here. Because if they don't do it here the way we do it here, they're not who we are. And if they're not who we are, they're out of here. So it's the, the system. Excellence of, the excellence of what we pursue and, and produce is built into the franchise operating system. System. That's what it's all about. That's the big positive in franchising. It's, it's how you explain in the e-myth what was going wrong with the pie maker, how, how she needed Absolutely. to do things differently. Now, yes. why is it, though, that technicians and managers who are the people who do buy franchises and should buy franchises, why is it that they don't all succeed? What is it that they don't understand about the importance of a system in business? Well, do you mean when they go into business by themselves or do you no, mean when they no, buy a when they buy a franchise? Let's let's say they 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 realize, look, I I can't I can't afford to, just because I'm a great pie maker doesn't mean that I know how to sell pies. I don't have the system for doing that. So I'll buy the pie system or the cookie system or whatever it is, the mechanic system. Why why do they not understand when they buy that following the system is the most important thing they should do and they don't do it. Well, it's the franchisor's responsibility and it's the franchisor's failure. When I see a franchisee who isn't following the system, I know the problem resides at the franchise company's um, responsibility. Mm -hmm. Good point. So the franchisor never spent the time, never spent the energy, never made the commitment, the zealous commitment necessary to make certain that the franchisee is putting into the store is absolutely masterly capable 
delivering that system infallibly. And it's the failure of the franchisor to do that, not the franchisee. Franchisee doesn't have a choice in the matter. You understand, if they're going to become that franchisee, they've already made their choice. Now it's the franchisor's responsibility, accountability, to make certain that that person is prepared, that that franchisee is prepared, that that franchisee is devoted to the system, to the strategy, to the formula, to the way we do it here to the excellence of that operating reality. And to the degree the franchisor doesn't do that, the franchisee does whatever they do. Mm -hmm. So should some technicians and managers not buy franchises? Of course. If they're not devoted to this model that I'm describing to you, yeah. if they think that they're in fact going to be able to do it however they wish to do it, to be able to make it up as they go out of here. They shouldn't be in a franchise. So I agree with you that it's the franchisor's responsibility. And very few people ever say that, by the way. I do say that occasionally. I don't want to offend franchisors. I'm glad you said it so emphatically. Franchisors, however, will come back and say, listen, uh, we train them all the same, all the technicians and all the managers to become franchisees. We train them all the same. We give them all five days of training in the classroom and three days of training out in the field. We sponsor regional meetings and annual meetings, and we do more training. John, John excuse me. five days of training and three days of training isn't training. It's guessing. Mm-hmm. You don't Let's say it's create, 15 days. Let's say it's 15 days. You don't create a great student in five days yeah. in a class. You do not. You never will. You cannot ever expect to create an absolutely viable franchise system based upon five days and three days. It's bullshit. Yeah. Okay. Let's say it's 15 days. Or how many days do you say it has to be, should be? Continuous. Continuous, continuous training. Okay. And they'll say, we, we offer that. We, we treat them all the same. And some of them become the best in our system. They become multimillionaires. John, when they say we do that, it's not true. So hear me, I can go look at that franchise company and tell you within a heartbeat whether or not they're doing it or not. Okay. It's not true. All right. Whenever you hear a franchisor say, yeah, but we do that, we do that. And yet his operating system tells me that the franchisee isn't doing that. I know there's something seriously missing in this picture. Mm -hmm. And that's the something that has to be addressed. Okay. The Let franchisee, me... the franchisor's franchise development system, the franchisee's development system, you can look at it and you look at it, you can look at it, you can improve upon it and make it an absolutely foolproof system. And the result will be success. But there are, are there some people who, regardless of the kind of training they get, and let's say it's continuous, excellent training. Are there some people who won't get it? And let me, let me go to this a disc profile, for example, that tells you all, per all people are not the same. We all have different personalities. Are there some people just better suited to becoming great students of franchise systems and mastering those systems? And are there others who, well, they're never going to get it. They should Absolutely. keep their job. Absolutely. Okay. Is and it the franchisor's responsibility to know the profile of the franchisee who succeeds and go get more of those people it is the franchisor's accountability and responsibility to select the franchisees inscrutably clearly emphatically to make certain that this individual is going to succeed at operating this system and to the degree they don't do that work, to the degree they need to do that work, they'll have the problem repeating itself, repeating itself, repeating mm -hmm. itself. This is so easily solved, John. Yeah, but they don't it's do so it. so easily solved. Yeah. 
so the system is sacrosanct, but how does a prospective franchisee know this is the system for me? If I buy this franchise, this is the system that I can become a multimillionaire with or not. How do they know that? How do they figure that out? Well, let, let's set aside the multimillionaire feature yeah. because the truth is, as you know, um, there are countless McDonald's franchisees who are not multimillionaires. Mm -hmm. In short, most franchisees will never become multimillionaires. Mm -hmm. They'll become financially successful. They'll not become, in quotes, multimillionaires. Mm -hmm. um, they were to, in fact, roll out seven franchises, nine franchises, 12 operating units. Yes, um, they become a group franchisee. Uh, then they're going to create an enterprise. Uh, it's rare that anyone owning an individual franchise unit is going to become a multimillionaire, but they don't go into business to become a multimillionaire. They become, go into business, they buy that franchise to be relatively successful financially, doing something they absolutely love to do. And for some people, doing something that they absolutely love to do is more important than becoming a multimillionaire. And they realize they can do that in a franchise. For lots of people. Yeah. Yes, for lots of people. But they probably will not succeed on their own. Having that entrepreneurial seizure and deciding, I'm going to get into the whatever business it may be that, that catches their fancy. John, you know and I know that building a franchise prototype, building a, a business that works is significant work. It takes Im immense imagination, innovation, persistence, dogged determination, a willingness to work 40 hours a day, a um, hundred days a week. It takes immense commitment um, to create something that stands alone in the world and delivers stunning results. So that's why the vast majority of people who start their own business don't make it. They're not really willing to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. They'll work for a living. Um, they'll, they'll fix a car, they'll bake a pie, they'll do the work that a technician does, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. But the kind of work we're talking about goes far beyond what the vast majority of people are willing to do. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been in the business of teaching people how to do the work that has to be done to build a successful business. We've made that immensely simple process. And the process works. We've done that with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of small business owners. But it takes a special persistence, a dogged determination, to go to work on one's business, just as it does to go to work on one's life in order to make it work. And that requires that, call it dogmatic determination to go beyond the ordinary. Um, that obviously too is absolutely critical when you buy a franchise. Because mm -hmm. that very first year of that franchise is learning. It's learning yeah. how to do it, learning how to do it, learning how to do it, nonstop learning how to do it, and letting go of any idea that you have yourself about who you are, what you are, what you want, et cetera, and so forth. It's the franchise, it's the franchise, it's the system that you're acquiring that's going to leverage you to producing something that's very difficult for you to ever produce on your own. So you're saying two things here, that you, you, the franchisee, have to be committed to this process, to this system, and you've got to make sure that the franchisor understands that commitment on your part, but that the franchisor has in fact created a system that really does work. And oftentimes that's not the case. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
So that's the very first and most fundamental thing, John. And you know this because you speak it and you've been in this industry all these years. Um, you know when you've got a franchisor who has literally done the work that's critical to produce a business format franchise. It's either a business format franchise or it's not. Mm -hmm. It's that, that very, very simple. It's a very simple question to ask any franchisor is, is your franchise a business format franchise? Is it turnkey? In fact, is it something that you've absolutely determined that every franchisee utilizes to the max? Every single one of them to the max. Mm -hmm. uh, if ands or buts about it, absolutely utilizes it to the max. So it can be replicated successfully thousands upon thousands of times. When I see a franchise that's only grown maybe to seven stores yeah. or 12 units or 30 units, you're looking at something that isn't really business format. It isn't business format because if it were business format, it would be significantly larger than that. So, Michael, two-thirds of the nearly 5,000 franchise brands that exist in North America, two-thirds do not have 100 units. What's wrong? My point. <laughs> yeah. It's my point. So the big question becomes, why not? I mean, that's the biggest and most important question. Why not two-thirds of all franchise companies have fewer than 100 units? Why not? Why haven't they grown beyond well, then they'd say, well, it's difficult to sell. It's difficult to find people. Yeah, yeah, hear me. I, I hear that answer all the time. Of course, it's difficult. Something that is missing in this picture. And so the question becomes, what's missing in this picture? And the minute you begin to look at that question, John, you begin to discover what's missing. And what's missing is the system. The system by which they reach out to prospective franchisees. If in fact there are a million new companies started every year in the United States, and that's the number the Small Business Administration has told mm -hmm. us for forever. Yeah. yeah. A million new companies started every year. If there are a million new companies started every year, um, then that means that there are a million people wanting to go into business for themselves every year in this country. Then what's missing in this picture? How come franchisors aren't acquiring the franchisees they're looking for? That's the big question. Once we accept this thing that it's got to be business format or forget it, it's either business format or forget it. It's either turnkey or get out of here. Once we accept that as a condition, then the only next condition is, so then what? And therein resides the greatest opportunity in franchising on this planet. So then what? If in <laughs> fact, it's a business format franchise, turnkey, literally turnkey, now say that and say that and say that and say that. Turnkey, 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 and it works. If it's that, then the greatest single question to ask is, so what's missing in this picture? Why aren't you acquiring the franchisees you desire to have in great, huge numbers? Hmm. And the answer is simply, the system doesn't work. And the system doesn't work because they don't know how to make it work. And they're using the wrong standards to measure it by. And so what standards should franchisors be using that they're not using to build these systems? They have to look at, they have to look at the psychographics and the demographics of the ideal franchisee. They have to look at the financial model upon which the business is built. So they have to look at the financial model and the psychographics and the demographics. And then they have to build a lead generation system and a client fulfillment system that will enable them to attract and convert 
prospective franchisees in a way that will enable them to grow significantly beyond where they are today. They have to look in their franchise development model, their franchise development model. And that's the work. Okay. That's very, very simple. Yeah. And psychographically, let's drill into that a little bit. What are they looking for exactly in psychographics? Where do they get that information? What information should they be looking at? Well, considering let's, not, find let's, make, let's not make it too um, scientific. Let's make it very, very simple. Yeah. Yeah. Is an individual who truly hungers to be on his or her own. They truly hunger to have a business of their own. They absolutely hunger to get away from working for somebody else. They want to be self-employed. And they want to be self-employed for all the good reasons that anybody would say they want to be self-employed. They want to be independent. They want to be free to do what they love to do. They want to be able to go to work every day and get the great feeling that they're producing a profoundly positive impact to the people who are their customers, their clients, the people they hire, the people they retain, et cetera. And so, so all the good stories that you hear yeah. by anybody who absolutely would love to be in business for themselves. Explain that to me. Tell me why. So I would ask that question. So why is it important to you to own your own business? What does that mean to you? And, tell the, and have them tell you why it's important to them and listen to what they say. Because it has to be what they say and what you need in a franchisee to match perfectly. In short, we can do that for you if you're willing and able to do for us what you need to do. So once we look at that match, that in fact, what you want to be able to have and do is what we have the ability to do, then the next question is, are you willing to step up to the plate and study, 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 and learn and master the system we're going to provide you with? There's got to be a way to test that. There's got to be a way to validate mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree well, to prove that out before they ever make the final commitment to become a franchisee, before mm -hmm. you ever make the final commitment to provide them with a license to become a franchisee. So I agree with, uh, with what you're saying. Uh, there are some people, uh, let, let's say there are 100 people, and they've got a great desire to be in their own business. And yes, they realize the value of a system. And yes, I'm willing to follow your system. But the fact is, those people are still not created equally. The passion is not enough in some of these cases. I ran We Buy Ugly Houses. You spoke to our convention. Big uh, 230, 40, 50 franchisees at the time. Some of those people could buy 100 houses a year because they knew instinctively how to do it. We didn't teach them how to buy houses. Others couldn't buy five houses a year. And of course, blamed it on us. They were good at rehabbing why, a house. Why couldn't they buy five houses a year? They didn't have the talent to do that. So what's the talent? The talent is to know how to go out and speak to someone who needs to sell their home. They're in an ugly situation, could be a divorce could be too many kids, could be they lost their job, all these reasons. Okay, let's Not, look, let, but let's look, but let's look at what you just yeah, said. Yeah. Um, they didn't have the talent, in quotes, to tell the story the way it needed to be told yeah. under this circumstance, this circumstance, this circumstance, this circumstance. Yeah. So let's look at that and break it down. So effectively, you said there are all kinds of reasons why. Mm -hmm. I want to know what all those kinds of reasons why okay. somebody is selling a home. One, two, three, four. Okay, this is script number one for one. This is script number one for two. This is so effectively, there's a system 
that is absolutely crucial to each and every one of those circumstances. Yes. You show me that franchise, I'll show you the absence of that system. Yes. You're looking for talent. McDonald's ain't looking for talent. So the minute you say I'm looking for talent, you got a problem. Mm -hmm. So you've got somebody who's got the talent, you somebody who doesn't have the talent, and somebody who doesn't have the talent is screwed. Somebody who's got the talent isn't. So effectively, your business is built upon personal talent rather than the personal system. So some people, they're too timid to offer you the price that the system tells them this is the price you have to buy at. They're too timid to do that. Now, how do you, are, are you going to spend your time as a franchisor retraining them on how not to be timid, how to come out of your box? I, I'm not sure that that's a good use of time. Why not better for the franchisor to find those people who aren't timid, who already have the ability to go out and do what needs to be done? Well, you can do that part, with a disc profile. But of course, but that's part of the system, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who does have the ability, somebody who does have the talent, somebody who does have the skill, somebody who does have the natural energy, somebody who does have the testosterone, somebody who does have whatever, 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 somebody who does have what's needed in order to be successful at doing this kind of work effectively. Mm -hmm. But match that somebody, their disc profile and the validation of it in quotes, the validation of it, de testing it, proving it, testing it, proving it, testing it, proving it. It's not just the disc profile, it's the validation of yeah, it. Yeah. Once having validated it operationally, I can see it in action. I can see it in action. I can see it in action. Once I have validated that profile in action, then, of course, I have the potential to create a great franchisee. But until I can see that disc profile in action, I've tested it, I've validated it, I've proven it to myself. I don't make him a franchisee. So I'm saying there always, John, is something missing in this picture that needs to be done. It's the thing the franchisor has left out. That's such a That's great awesome. point. And we don't hear that often enough. Franchisors leave a lot out, not because they want to, um, not because necessarily they don't know any better. Uh, although I think that is the point. They, is. they haven't They're read the e myth. Hope. They're living in hope. We did the yeah. disc. We did the disc. We did yeah. the disc. He gave us a great score. He gave us a great score. Yeah, but did you challenge it? Did you challenge their score? Did you challenge their disc? Did you challenge their authenticity? Did you challenge their commitment? Did you challenge their zeal? Did you, in short, did you challenge it, challenge it? We don't challenge it. We take their money mm -hmm. and live in hope that they will do what needs to be done in order to succeed at this. Mm -hmm. Sadly. Not that... to live in hope. Yeah. Sadly, a lot of franchisors live in hope. Of course, of course they are. Yeah. They're living in hope. So I want to. If switch. they were to stop that, they would be validating the system in earnest. Yeah. So before they ever awarded a franchise, they would have an eighty percent chance of success because they validated what is needed in order for that guy to really be successful. Mm -hmm. So I want to look at something a little differently. You probably know Greg Flynn or the Flynn Restaurant Group, one of the largest franchisee groups in the world, uh, four billion in sales in 2022, 940 Pizza Huts, 440 uh, Applebee's. Uh, they also own Arby's, Wendy's, Panera, Taco Bell. Uh, that's an entrepreneur this uh, Greg Flynn. I don't know him personally, uh, but that's an entrepreneur who bought not one franchise, multiple franchises. So do some entrepreneurs 
buy franchises and should they? Of course, of course. Yeah, and they do it with a completely different picture in mind. They don't do it to go to work in the franchise. They exactly. do it to grow a company, an enterprise. Yeah. yeah. They don't do it to go to work in the franchise. They don't do it to cook pizza. They don't do it to work, work, work. They don't do that. They're entrepreneurs. They're, they're creators. Mm -hmm. um, they're growers. So some entrepreneurs will buy franchises for a different reason because they want to work on it rather than in it. Flynn has done it exceptionally well. Others uh, doing that as well. They recognize the value of franchising, which boils down again to the system. It's all about the system and the ability to teach people how to use the system. And this is something that franchisors are not doing well enough. When and, an uh, entrepreneur, when an entrepreneur acquires a franchise, they're acquiring the franchise as a product. They're not acquiring the franchise as a job. They're acquiring the franchise as a product, the business as a product, and they're going to roll out that product just like a franchisor is. Mm -hmm. So that franchisee is just like a franchisor. Who entrepreneur? Yes. The distinction is absolutely critical. Michael, uh, I think we've, uh, one thing that I need to cover with you as well, technology integration. So every day, and, and as you can see, I'm not so good at technology myself. Uh, uh, what, what's, why my camera isn't working, I have no clue. But that's, uh, that never happened until I started interviewing you, by the way, and you had your camera issue. Technology, we can't live without it. And franchise companies are are turning to technology, um, depending on technology. But the integration of technology, which is revolutionizing not only franchising but but everything that we do in the world, what are franchisors going to have to do about that in order to bring technology in successfully and streamline their operations? And again get franchisees who are capable of using the technology uh, beneficially and successfully, financially successfully? John, the answer to that question is so obvious. Um, you need to possess the technological understanding to be able to apply technology to the work that you do. Um, if, if, in fact, a business is a system and it's in an, 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 an the very best of all an integrated system in which step number six, uh, component number five, et cetera, work in tandem with each other to produce an absolutely predictably orchestrated result, then of course you need to have the capability internally to create those systems. And that goes without saying. So no franchisor could ever create a franchise absent that authority, that capability, that, 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 that knowledge. So the, exactly. the, the, the um, chief technology officer of a franchise operating system is a critical role, just like the CMO, the chief marketing officer of a franchise system is a critical fundamental yeah. role, yeah. just like the chief operating officer of a franchise company is a critical role. So those are fundamentally critical roles that have to exist within an operating system for it to work. Another thing today, semi-absentee and absentee opportunities in franchising. Used to be they didn't exist. Franchisor said, no, 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 you've got to be there. You've got to work this system to be successful. But today, and particularly looking at the Gen Zs, but probably since the millennials, there has been a desire for lifestyle to come first, work to come second. Does franchise absentee ownership play into that? I think it does. Should it? I'm going to turn to you for that. You understand that franchisee absentee ownership is only possible when you have operating capability within that franchise. Mm -hmm. 
So if the franchisee is not going to be there, the franchisee will say is the chief executive officer of that franchise unit. That chief executive officer of that franchise unit has to have a chief operating officer of that franchise unit who is in fact responsible for making certain that the franchise system works. The CEO, the, the, the chief executive officer, the franchisee, the absentee franchisee can't be absent 100% of the time he or she has to be in control, in charge of the operating reality of that company to bring the leadership that's crucial. If the operating reality of that company is going to observe and obey um, the systematic requirements that will cause the success to happen in that company. So this is bringing even more pressure on franchisors. If you're going to offer semi-absentee or absentee ownership opportunities, that's a whole nother system for you to develop and to be accountable for. You do understand it is and it isn't. Because effectively what we're really saying is it's a business format franchise. Yes. Period. Um, I don't care what business it is. It's a business format franchise. This is how we do it here, is sacrosanct. Yeah. And therefore, someone needs to be accountable and responsible for that business form of franchise. Someone has got to take charge of that business format franchise. Somebody has to stand up and be counted to be accountable for the operation of that business format franchise. It ain't going to happen on its own. Here we go. If the franchisee is not going to be there 100% of the time, somebody will be there 100% of the time and will report to the franchisee who is accountable for the operation of that franchise. Mm -hmm. Because it's the franchisee's name who's on the line. The franchisee who's got the relationship with the franchisor. So the franchisee is ultimately accountable and responsible for the integrity of that operation. You don't have to be there 100% of the time. If you can get the result that this franchise system requires you to get, that's what you're signing on the line for. Mm. This Great is point. how you do that. This is how you do that. Yeah. This is how you do that. Or not. Yeah. And if not, you're gone. Well, Michael, that's a great place to wrap this up. I've taken lots of your time. I appreciate it. The information has been fantastic. And I wish you all the best. Keep writing those E-Myth books. And we'll keep reading them. John, wonderful. And do this. Tell this story to every franchisor you speak to and you speak to them all. Tell this story emphatically to every single one of them. Every single one of them have got to buy this vision to the degree that Ray Kroc did at the very outset. It's got to work, it's got to work, it's got to work. And this is how you do it, this is how you do it. And there is no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And to the degree you do that, will literally transform the state of franchising worldwide. Literally, not virtually, literally, and create an economic reality unparalleled on the planet. We have the ability to make that happen. And we will. You got Michael, it. thank you. I appreciate it. And, Love you, John. Take uh, we'll care. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to the Franchise Hot Seat Podcast with Dr. John P. Hayes. Tune in next time for more conversation around all things franchising.